common security, human security, um, and putting them forward. So these are not new concepts. Uh, and what is the really important, though, is how we can make progress on these concepts and the opportunities that are, that are there, that are, that are rising for us to move forward. But also the imperative, because as Jonathan mentioned, the existential threats to the planet are so acute now. Um, I'm going to talk about the nuclear weapons threat, which we've seen has risen you know, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It was bad even before then. Uh, in, in the beginning of the year in January, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists uh, reset, you know, their doomsday clock to 100 seconds to midnight because of the risks of climate change, nuclear war, intense uh, intensification of conflicts between countries with nuclear weapons and still nuclear weapons still being very much of the political dynamic uh, between those countries that have them and those countries that don't and between the countries that have them between each other. And then we had the, the Russian war of Ukraine and it all came to the fore and we've seen it played out with Putin using the threat of nuclear weapons as a coercive tool to try and sort of consolidate you know his his invasion uh, and an annexation of Ukraine uh, and then others Finland and Sweden responding going oh dear maybe we no longer can be secure uh, without coming under the nuclear umbrella and so applying to join NATO so we're seeing this play out uh, and here is where I am bringing in a common security framework to complement the human security because I don't believe in the nuclear weapons world at the moment based on how we've seen the nuclear weapon states and the allied states behave that they are ready to jump to a human security framework yet. I mean, at the moment, the primary security framework for these countries and many other countries, the primary part is national security which requires military capacity in order to protect territorial integrity. That's still part of the security planning uh, in the governments, in the parliaments, in the discussions. It's how do we ensure that we have sufficient and adequate and appropriate military means, whether it's individually or as part of an alliance structure in order to protect our territorial integrity. It's not the only discussion. I mean, they are also, there are also discussions on the other human security issues, but the national security requiring military capacity comes first. Now, with the nuclear weapons, there are already been attempts to try and shift that, to get rid of that, uh, extract it from the rest in a sense and say, look, nuclear weapons are illegal, they're criminal, there is an obligation under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to eliminate them. Uh, that wasn't working very well. Uh, and so there was brought in a, like a human security or a humanitarian framework to try and emphasize the human humanitarian issues of nuclear weapons. Uh, it got a lot of attention. There were international conferences. Norway hosted one. Mexico hosted one. Austria hosted one. There was humanitarian consequences statements that were presented to the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conferences. Uh, they paved the way for the negotiations for a, a treaty, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. But none of this has shifted the nuclear weapon states or the allied states away from their reliance on nuclear deterrence. Not one of them has joined the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It provides a capacity for them to do so, but not one has. Uh, and so even though I agree with Gary and I agree with, with Jonathan, that we should be moving to a human security framework. And there's no role for nuclear weapons in a human security framework. At the moment, we haven't convinced, we moved the nuclear armed and allied states to do that. Now, one, there are a number of reasons for that. There's not just one. But one of the reasons is that they still perceive that nuclear weapons provide a security role. The security role is actually a legitimate one. De you know, defending your territory. You've got a right you know, under the UN Charter, self-defense. Uh, but the means of exercising that, the threat of use or use of nuclear weapons is not legitimate. You know, we've already heard from the International Court of Justice in 96 that the threat or use of nuclear weapons is a violation of international humanitarian law and the law of peace and security. And we've heard from the Human Rights uh, Committee in 2018, that the threat or use of nuclear weapons is a, is a violation of the right to life under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. 
and I mentioned this already, you know, the nuclear weapon states have agreed. Yes, they have obligations to move towards a nuclear weapons free world, but they're not willing to do so while they still see a security need for those nuclear weapons to provide national security. So in order to make this jump you know, from a world based on primarily on national security requiring military capacity, where nuclear weapons are one of the key elements for a large number of states, the allied states and the nuclear weapon states, to get to human security, I believe we need to emphasize a common security framework and elevate that. Now, what I mean by that, Gary's already mentioned a little bit about what we mean by common security. It's where you're looking at uh, ensuring that your security needs are met without diminishing the security of others. Okay, now that's a good concept, but how does that then work in practice? Well, in practice, then it, 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 it employs common security mechanisms for, on two key aspects of this. One is conflict resolution. So when there are disputes, conflicts, using different conflict resolution tools. Now, we don't have to invent those. They exist. We have the Permanent Court of Arbitration. We have the International Court of Justice. We have the good offices of the UN Secretary General that provides mediation services. I know because our country, New Zealand, has used that office in order to resolve the dispute with France, a much more powerful country than us, uh, when they blew up our peace boat, the Rainbow Warrior, in our harbour, act of terrorism. We used the good offices of the Secretary General for mediating that, and we had a fantastic solution, result, resolved the conflict. Uh, so there are also there are, there are, in, in the UN Charter outlines a range of uh, methods, you know, negotiation, arbitration, adjudication, uh, using regional um, measures as well. Uh, in Europe, there's the Organisation for Securing Cooperation in Europe, which does have mechanisms there. The problem is, is that even though we have a lot of common security mechanisms to be able to resolve conflicts between countries, countries don't use them enough and they don't put enough emphasis on them. When a conflict comes with, up with another country, often the first approach they take, whether it's the government or the media, is, oh, what's our military response going to be? You know, uh, do we need to build up our military forces? You know, do we need to sort of have an exercise to demonstrate our resolve? This sort of like crazy military response, uh, rather than how might we resolve this issue? What are the mechanisms available to resolve that? And how are we going to utilize those mechanisms? Now, if in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, some of those mechanisms had been used earlier, we might have been able to prevent the Russian invasion of Ukraine. For example, you know, the, the Crimea issue. It was basically frozen between a Western narrative about Crimea and the Russian narrative about Crimea. And all the, the, those two blocks were doing was shouting at each other, um, saying, we're right now, that we're right. They could, they, this could have been taken to a, a mediation process um, or even to an adjudication process in the International Court of Justice, which has resolved territorial disputes in the past. Uh, the, the claims about genocide in the Donbass region. Well, there's a, there's a process under the Genocide Convention which should have been used before the, the Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine decided after the invasion. It should have been done before. And, and, and we now have a case in the International Court of Justice, but it's a bit too late because we already have the Russian invasion. Um, you know, the Human Rights Council has now come into play, but again, it's after the fact, and the UN General Assembly, of course, because the Security Council wasn't in operation. We see that these mechanisms are available, but we don't use them enough. We don't put enough emphasis in them. Too much financing and political uh, capital is put into the militaristic ones. So elevating the common security approaches, demonstrating that they're successful uh, in the International Court of Justice cases which have dealt with territorial disputes, virtually all of them have then been resolved after the court gave its decision, whether it was the Chad Libya case, and there were like having three military confrontations prior to the Chad Libya case in the International Court of Justice, but after the court made its decision, they resolved it, similar with Nicaragua and Costa Rica, over Nicaragua occupying the disputed island between them. After it went to the International Court of Justice, they were able to resolve this. Uh, and there are many other cases of disputes which seem to be intractable, but then using one of these common security mechanisms have been able to be resolved. One of the reasons for that, there are a number of reasons for this, but one of the reasons is it gives a little bit of time. 
when, you know, it, so heads can, tempers can cool down a little bit. It also provides like a third party neutral process. So a country can accept a decision from an international court of justice or from a mediation process that they might not be able to accept in direct negotiations with another country. You've got a third party. They're not giving in to the other side. They're actually following an approach that has been put forward by a third party. So these are some of the things that need to be used more. We have them available in the UN Charter. And if we use these to address some of the legitimate security concerns of the countries that are relying on nuclear weapons, that will be a way of then convincing them to give up their nuclear weapons. Um, and we've seen this approach in the past. Uh, uh, South Africa you know, had six nuclear weapons. We know they were secret. Um, it was part of the Cold War conflict. Uh, but then President uh, F.W. de Klerk uh, reframed that situation um, at the end of the Cold War and allowed for the weapons to be demolished in South Africa, then to join the NPT as a non-nuclear state because the security reasons were resolved in other ways. Uh, so this is something we need to take forward. Um, I think with, we also have some capacities to enhance the common security mechanisms. Now, I don't, I don't think we have to reinvent them because they're, they're, most of them are there, but there are some opportunities to enhance and build them. For example, International Court of Justice. Um, at the moment, you can have cases either by voluntary acceptance of the jurisdiction or through jurisdiction given by treaties or through advisory opinion. Uh, we can strengthen all three approaches. We can encourage more countries to accept voluntary jurisdiction International Court of Justice. We can ensure that treaties in a regular basis negotiating include reference to the International Court of Justice. And we can use the advisory opinion approach more. And in fact, there is one about to happen, which is really important, which is taking the issue of climate change to the International Court of Justice uh, by, on advisory opinion based on what we did with nuclear weapons back in 95, 96. So these approaches can be taken and strengthened. But in addition, we can, we can build, there's an opportunity coming up with the UN Summit of the Future in 2024 to repurpose the Trusteeship Council. Uh, this was proposed by the UN Secretary General in the new agenda for peace. Repurposing the Trusteeship Council could uh, provide a way of bringing in the four global commons into one governance a body, uh, the four global commons, uh, as, as identified so far, are outer space, uh, the climate, uh, the oceans, and cyberspace. And they're all grappling with how do you manage global commons, which are, you know, for the benefit of, of all, for current and future generations. And they're all using different mechanisms. So this is one of the ideas that could be established through the UN Summit of the Future in 2024. Already, uh, it's on the, on, the, on the board and it's likely to happen that the Summit of the Future will establish at least a position of the UN Special Envoy for Future Generations. Um, so this process, the Summit of the Future, and also the SDG Summit, which will be later this year in September, give us opportunities uh, to strengthen uh, these uh, security mechanisms and, in a sense, replace the idea of the force of law, uh, sorry, the, the law of force with the force of peace and law. Um, and I believe that's possible, but to help move that forward, we need to have civil society engagement and parliamentarians, as Gary mentioned, and others. So we have an appeal, which we uh, I'm just putting on the screen now, uh, protect people on the planet, appeal for a nuclear weapons free world, but also looks at the context of building nuclear disarmament as part of a human security and common security framework by supporting public health, the climate and sustainable development. We already have 1,700 influential people signing this, including a number of Nobel laureates. There's just a few of them down there and former uh, foreign ministers, prime ministers, former military uh, leaders, etc. Uh, if you haven't already endorsed, some of you I know already have, we welcome you to endorse it. It's on unfoldzero.org. And this is one of the tools that we're using to advance common security and human security framework and these new opportunities are like the UN Summit of the Future.